Welcome to Spinal Solutions, an education program about neck and back pain brought to you by Outpatient Physical Therapy. Today we're going to go over some anatomy of the spine as well as some common medical terminology that you may have heard. We're going to talk about different causes of neck and back pain and then we're going to get into some treatment options for you. Looking at our spine anatomy, you can see our spine is made up of three gentle curves. This is our neutral spine position. And this is what most of our spines look like. However, it is possible to either be born with or throughout our lives develop variances in this anatomy. For some, these curves may start to flatten out. For others, they may increase. We don't worry about these anatomical variations unless it becomes so severe that they start to limit our movement. Our spine itself is made up of different bones or vertebrae stacked on top of each other. In between the vertebrae, here in blue, is our disc. The disc is mostly filled with fluid and provides shock absorption as well as gives our spine some stability. At the back of each vertebrae is an opening where a spinal cord travels. And then at each vertebrae, at each level, on each side, we have openings for our spinal nerves. This is where our nerves come from our spinal cord and go throughout our body, as well as our sensory nerves coming up through our body through the spinal cord and up to our brain. Some medical terms that you may have heard include degenerative disc disease. This is a normal aging process that occurs at our discs and begins at about the age of 30. So because our discs are filled with fluid, as we get older, we start to lose some of that fluid and our discs can start to shrink in height. This is why we all get shorter as we get older. At our disc, we can also have bulges or herniations. This means instead of our normal round shape, our disc can start to push out in any direction to varying degrees. A lot of us have these and don't even realize it. They only become a problem if they push out in a direction where they start to limit our movement or compress our nerves. You may have also heard of degenerative joint disease. This is just a fancy way of saying arthritis. This is a normal aging process that occurs in our joints. It begins at about the age of 30 and can mean that maybe our vertebrae aren't so smooth and uniform anymore. It's not necessarily a problem unless it gets to the point that it's so severe that again it's limiting our movement. Stenosis is a degeneration that occurs specifically around the openings in our spine, either around the spinal cord or where our spinal nerves travel. Again, a lot of us have this and don't even realize it because it doesn't become a problem unless it gets to be so severe that it's compressing our nerves. Many of you have probably already had imaging of your spine. This is an example of a lumbar MRI, or an image of the low back. I know probably none of you are radiologists, but looking at this image, you can see that red arrow that's pointing towards something that looks like maybe that's not quite normal. Would you think that this person would be limited in their activities based on what you're seeing? A lot of people would think yes. However, this is an image from a rugby player from the 2016 Olympics. So somebody who's really not very limited at all. The point being is we never just treat imaging. And the reason for that is a lot of us will start to have changes in our imaging that occur starting after about the age of 30. Most of us have these changes and we don't even know it because they don't even cause problems. On the other hand, we can have someone who has a lot of pain, but their imaging is relatively normal. This is why it's really important to correlate any imaging that we have with a clinical examination. The other important thing to keep in mind is imaging just gives us a static picture. It doesn't tell us anything about movement. For some of us, we could have joints that are stiff and don't move very well, or we have joints that move too much, and these don't always show up on imaging. So odds are, if you're watching this video, you're over the age of 30 and probably have some of those degenerative changes occurring in your spine. That's okay. It happens to almost everyone, and it doesn't mean that you're going to be limited at all. The most important thing is to keep our joints and our bodies moving. Our spines are actually very, very mobile. We can bend, we can extend, we can rotate, we can bend to the side, or any combination of these movements. So for that reason, our spine needs a lot of stability, 
and most of that comes from the muscles around our spine. You may have heard of your core muscles, and usually people are talking about the abdominals, the obliques on the sides, the muscles of the low back, and the big muscles around the hips. Okay? But really you can think of the stabilizing muscles as any of the muscles in your trunk. Okay? Up in our necks, our stability comes from the muscles between our shoulder blades and in the front of our neck. We also get some stability from the disc, like we talked about, as well as all of these different ligaments around the spine. Most of our stability comes from our muscles. However, if our muscles aren't doing our, the job the way that they're supposed to, we start to rely more on our joints and our ligaments. And they don't like that. They're not designed for that. So a lot of times if we go back and we fix the problem and we teach the muscles how to do their job the way that they're supposed to, a lot of that stress on the joints and the ligaments goes away and this helps with our pain. Now we're going to talk about common causes of neck and back pain. But as we do, I want you to think about this quote. All human beings should be able to perform basic maintenance on themselves. So if we think of our bodies like our cars, as we go through life, it's inevitable that we're going to hit little speed bumps or potholes in the road. In our bodies, this can show up as different flare-ups of pain. And what we really want to leave you with today is some different tools to be able to manage that pain to get you back to your baseline. Now, of course, we have to talk about posture. Even as I say that, you're probably straightening yourself up a little bit in your chair, okay? Most of us don't think too much about our posture during the day. But if we think about our necks first, our head is like a big 12 pound bowling ball and it sits on top of our relatively small cervical spine or our neck. If we're stacked in this nice position here, okay, it's easiest for our body to stabilize that head. Every degree away from that position that we get makes it harder and harder for our body to do its job. In addition, we can start to get different compression on our joints. Additionally, if we're all the way in this forward head posture, it's difficult for our muscles to do their job. Certain muscles can get tight and then it's hard for them to contract and stabilize, where other muscles can be kind of stretched out and they're just barely hanging on for dear life. So it's not going to happen overnight but working towards getting back to this nice stacked posture here can really help to prevent a lot of pain. The same is true for the rest of our bodies. If we're just kind of letting our body hang out on our joints and our ligaments, our muscles aren't really supporting us. So we want to be upright with our muscles active. Ergonomics is kind of the fancy term for talking about our workstation setup. If we look at this first image here of this gentleman at his workstation, if he spent eight hours like that, we can bet that definitely if he didn't have pain before, he would definitely have pain by the end of the day. So in general, when you're setting up a computer station, you'd like for your monitor to be about at eye level. We want about 90 degrees at the elbows, the hips, the knees, and the ankles, give or take, depending on your anatomy and your comfort. The same rules hold true for when we're on our devices. Okay? Being in this position here where we're looking down all the time, you might win that candy crush level, but your neck's probably not going to be too happy after very long. So just bring those devices up closer to eye level. Hopefully you're still with me and you're still awake and you're chuckling at my cartoon. So when it comes to activity, the bad news is our bodies are very adaptable. Okay? So a lot of times when we have an increase in pain, we want to be as inactive as possible. And we actually used to tell people to go home and lay in bed and not really move very much if you're having an increase in pain. And we're finding out that that's actually probably the worst thing that you can do. So if you have an increase in pain, while it's okay to limit aggravating activities for a couple days, you want to get back to being as active as you can as quickly as you can because our bodies will start to adapt, even after one day. So a lot of times, if I'm having trouble walking, say for 20 minutes, 
I stop walking 20 minutes. Maybe I only walk 10 minutes. My body will adapt to that. Soon I'm only able to walk 10 minutes. And even that becomes painful. And then I start to limit myself further and further. The good news is our bodies are adaptable and can adapt all throughout our lifetime. So if I'm only able to walk 10 minutes, I can start increasing my walking and be able to walk 11, 12, 15, and 20 minutes. Our bodies will adapt to whatever stress we put on them. So we wanna make sure we're challenging ourselves and staying active and not ending up in that deconditioning cycle. Okay, who's guilty of this one? Who's got their wallet in their back pocket? So even if your wallet is small or thin, having it in your back pocket can change your posture. It makes us a little uneven at our pelvis and that causes stresses that can go all the way up the spine. If you tend to sit a lot, your body will start to adapt to this and we can get some shortening of muscles and lengthening of muscles and then that posture can become permanent. So when you sit down, take your wallet out of your back pocket, put it on the table or put it in the, your front pocket. When we think about posture or positioning, sometimes we forget about our sleeping position. But in theory, we're spending about a third of our lives in bed. So you wanna make sure that you're in a nice position. If we think back to that picture of our posture, we wanna imitate that as closely as we can even when we're sleeping. So when it comes to your pillow, you wanna be supported in a nice straight position. If you sleep on your back, you just need typically a small pillow, maybe with a little bit of a contour, okay, that helps to fill the space between the back of your neck and the top of your shoulders. We don't want something that's too fluffy and putting you up in this position, and we don't want something that's too flat and tipping your chin up. If you sleep on your side, now we need to fill the space between the side of your neck and the side of your shoulders. This typically requires a bigger pillow, especially if you have broad shoulders. We don't want something, again, that's too fluffy and tipping your head up, or that's not giving you good enough support and your head's tipping down. If you find that you're often waking up with your arm underneath your pillow or underneath your head, that's generally a pretty good sign that your pillow is not giving you enough support. Your body's trying to find it from somewhere. But having your arm up in that position all night is not great for your shoulder or your neck. Okay, so it probably means you need to change your pillow. The same rules apply for a mattress. We don't want something that's so soft that you're sinking in, but we don't want something that's too firm and doesn't accommodate for the curves at your hip and your shoulder. If you sleep on your back, oftentimes a small pillow underneath the back of your knees can take some pressure off of your back. Or if you sleep on your side, a pillow in between your thighs can help support your spine and your pelvis. Now, no matter what those infomercials tell you, there is no perfect pillow or mattress that will work for everyone. Everyone's body is a little bit different, so you need to find what works for you. Usually what I recommend when you're trying out a pillow or a mattress, whether that's from your closet at home or in a store, you wanna take a picture of yourself in that position. So you can either have someone take that picture for you or just take a selfie on your phone and see what your position looks like. Oftentimes we can be in kind of a wonky position and not even realize it. And you wanna make sure that you're staying in that position for at least 20 minutes and then taking another picture. Some materials, especially the memory foam or the viscoelastic foam, as it heats up from your body temperature, it gets a little softer. So you may start out in a good position, but after about 20 minutes and for the rest of your night, you're not getting the support that you need. You're gonna be spending a lot of time in bed, so commit to finding a mattress and a pillow that will work for you. When it comes to lifting, we've all probably heard the phrase, lift with your legs. So when we're lifting, we never wanna bend over at the waist. From a physics standpoint, this actually increases the load on our back because it increases our lever arm. It also means we're only using the back muscles and we're not even using the big muscles in our legs. 
Okay, so our, our legs and our hips in general are very mobile, and we also have a lot of big, strong muscles there. So let them do the work. So ideally, you come into this nice deep squat position. You get your hands underneath the object. As you come up, you keep that object close to you, and you keep it close to you as you're carrying it. If you're going to set it down, you turn your whole body. Try not to twist at your waist. If you're having a hard time getting into that deep squat position, it can help to bring your feet a little bit wider or turn your feet out. If you have one leg that kind of bothers you more than the other, maybe you had a joint replacement on that side, you can stagger your feet and bring your stronger leg back while your weaker leg is a little bit forward. And these can help you get in a nice deep squat position to be able to easier lift objects off the floor. Obtaining and maintaining a healthy weight can also help not only your spine, but all your joints. The more weight we have, the more compression on all our joints. Sometimes even just losing five pounds can make a big difference. Especially if our weight is carried in our abdomen, that can put more stress on our spine. The VA does offer some different programs for weight loss and weight management. There's the MOVE program, which is an education program as well as a support group to give you some general information on nutrition and exercise. And then there are other nutrition services. We have nutrition classes as well as one-on-one -on -one nutrition services. If this is something that you're interested in, please contact your primary care provider. So now that you know what's causing some of our pain, we're gonna get into what we can do about it. So if we think back to that metaphor of our bodies as a car, you are in the driver's seat of your life, and you can point your life down any road that you want to travel. You choose how fast or how slow you want to go, but most importantly, you can change the road that you're on at any time. So even though you may be in this cycle of pain and inactivity, sometimes making even small changes can have a big impact on your pain and your function. When we think about different treatment options, we can generalize these into passive and active treatments. Passive treatments are things that are done to us. So it could be like a massage, using a heat pack or an ice pack, using different medication, TENS or electrical stimulation, those sorts of things. Whereas our active treatment is more of working on managing our weight, exercising, adopting a movement practice, and making other lifestyle changes. So when we look at the research, studies have found that patients who accept personal responsibility for their pain do better than those who leave it to others. And this requires that active participation, those active treatments. That doesn't mean you can't use those passive treatments as well, but the passive treatments by themselves are not enough. Now we're going to talk a little bit about different exercise. Whenever you're going to exercise, we always want to start with some sort of warm up. And that's 10 to 20 minutes of light to moderate activity in order to get some blood flowing through your body, increase your circulation, get your muscles limbered up, basically get your body ready to move. Your warm up can be whatever you'd like it to be. Maybe you like to go for a walk or get on the treadmill. Maybe you prefer to bike or get in the pool. Find whatever is going to work for you. First, we're going to go over some different stretches. Now with all of these stretches, we're just looking for a light to medium stretch sensation. We don't want it to be painful. We don't even want a pulling sensation. We hold all of our stretches for one minute. That stretch needs to stay comfortable over that whole minute. We don't want it to become achy or painful at any point. As we talk about different exercises, please keep in mind these are very general exercises that are appropriate for most people. They're not designed to be painful at all. So please don't complete an exercise if it increases your pain. We're going to begin with some stretches for the low back. For stretch number one, this is for a muscle on the back of the thigh that goes from below the knee all the way up to the pelvis. It tends to get tight if we sit a lot. And if it does get tight, it can pull on the pelvis and change the positioning in our spine. So what you're going to do is start with your leg down flat against your bed. You'll loop a towel, a dog leash, a belt, whatever you have around your foot. With your arms, you're going to start to pull up on your leg until you feel that light to medium stretch on the back of the thigh. 
Stretch number two is for a muscle on the front of the hip that also tends to get tight if we sit a lot and can also pull on the pelvis if it does get tight. So on the edge of your bed, you'll leave one knee bent and let the other leg hang over the edge until you feel a stretch on the front of the hip or the front of the thigh. Stretch number three is for our calves. Now you may be wondering why we worry about our calves if we're thinking about our low back. But if our calf muscles get tight, they can change the way that we walk and that stress can travel all the way up the spine. So with your hands against the wall or on a countertop, you're going to stagger your feet. Make sure your back foot is straight and then keeping your back knee straight, you will bend your front knee until you feel a stretch on the back calf. Remember, all of your stretches are held for one minute. To stretch the low back more specifically, we can start by lying on our back. For number four, you're going to pull your knee up towards your chest to feel a gentle stretch either in the back of the hip or in the low back, depending on your flexibility. To stretch the back of the hip more specifically, as you see in number five, you're going to pull that knee up towards your opposite shoulder. For number six, you start with your knees bent. Then just gently rock your knees side to side to feel a stretch in the side of your hip or in your low back. This one can be done a couple of different ways. You can hold your knees to each side for a minute, or you can gently rock your knees side to side for a minute. This is a nice one to do in the morning. Number seven is a good one to do if your symptoms are worse with sitting and tend to get better in standing. From a lying down position on your stomach, you're just going to prop yourself up onto your elbows to stretch the low back. Relax in your lap and gently tip your head towards the side, bringing your ear towards your shoulder. You should feel that nice stretch on the opposite side of your neck. For number nine, you're going to slightly turn your head to the side and then look down, kind of like you're looking at your elbow. Again, you should feel this on the opposite side of your neck, but a little bit more towards the back of your neck. Number 10 is a good exercise for the upper to mid back that tends to be stiff in people with neck or low back pain. You're going to start by lying on your side, pull your knees up towards your chest. You can let your top arm just rest on the side of your body, and then you're turning your shoulder backwards until you feel that stretch in the mid to upper back area. I mentioned before how important stability is for our spine. For our stabilization exercises, you're going to hold five to 10 seconds and complete five to 10 repetitions. Where you fall in that range just depends on where you're at right now. You might find that five seconds is really challenging and then that's where you start and work your way up from there. For number 11, we're targeting the deep abdominal muscles that help to stabilize our spine and pelvis. You can do this in any position, but one of the easier ways to learn is lying on your back with your knees bent. What you're going to do is pull your belly button up and in towards your spine. We're not flattening our low back or cramming it down into our bed, just gently activating the muscles on the front of our body. It can help if you rest your hands on your abdomen and feel for the tension there. For number 12, we're targeting our hip muscles that also help to stabilize the pelvis. Again, can be done in any position. What you're going to do is tighten those muscles. Think like you're squeezing or pinching together. In order to stabilize our necks, we need to target the muscles between our shoulder blades and in the front of our necks. For number 13, and gently squeeze your shoulder blades down and in towards your spine in a diagonal pattern. You may feel a stretch in the front of your chest or on the top of your shoulders. That's okay. For number 14, you can lie down with a small pillow or a towel behind your head. Slightly tuck your chin and press your head back into the pillow like you're trying to squish it into the bed. This can also be done from a sitting position where you're trying to pull your ears back so they're in line with your shoulders. Another really important part of spine health is having an overall wellness program. And that's going to look different for each one of you. Maybe you also like to incorporate going for walks or hikes with your neighbors. Maybe you do yoga. Maybe you like to go to the gym five days a week or do exercise classes. Find what works for you, but try a lot of different things because you might be surprised about what you enjoy. While you may be a bit apprehensive about starting some different exercises, we do have some additional resources for you. We've created a website 
that has all the different gone over today, as well as some modifications and progressions. You're just going to enter the web page listed in the link here and enter the code when it prompts you. And this will give you pictures as well as written instructions of all the different exercises that we went over today. Most of these have videos. You'll also find that there are different modifications and progressions. So perhaps you try an exercise and it doesn't feel quite comfortable for you. Then you could try one of the modifications. If you've been doing an exercise for a few weeks and it's starting to feel easy, try one of the progressions. If after watching this presentation, you still have questions, please reach out to us in outpatient physical therapy at 520-792-1450, extension 12107. Thank you, take care, and stay healthy.